A warm welcome to all of you this evening, to the Institute for Human Sciences here in Vienna and to our library. My name is Ivan Veivoda. I'm the acting rector and a permanent fellow here in the Institute. And it gives me a really and truly great pleasure to be the host of this evening and the moderator. Um, our keynote speaker of this monthly lecture at IWM is uh, Professor Dario Stola, uh, to my left, who is a professor of history uh, at the Institute of Political Studies of the Polish Academy of Sciences and formerly the director of the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. And also, which is wonderful for us, a member of our governing board here uh, at the Institute. Uh, to comment tonight, uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, our senior fellow currently at the IWM, uh, Professor Ranabir Samadar, who is a distinguished chair in migration and forced migration studies at the Calcutta Research Group. We have a very interesting and somewhat intriguing title, The Limits of Migration Control, What Can We Learn from Communist Polish communists. So, Darius, please take the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ivan, for the introduction and for the invitation to have this presentation for you today. Uh, I'm going to talk about the history of migrations from communist Poland and the uh, key factor shaping them, that is migration policies, including the limits of the migration policies of the, of the Polish communist government. But let me start with... Uh, uh, rather unexpected praise of the communist regime. It's not that I'm recommending it to anyone, but I'm recommending research on the communist period to anyone, not just the historians of the communist period. I believe that uh, now when it's gone, and when the archives of, of the communist governments in most of the countries, not all of them, not in Russia, but in Poland, Hungary, former East Germany, are accessible to historians, they offer uh, a truly a treasure of data on various social phenomena that underwent dramatic transformations as a consequence of, of the communist uh, policies. So um, what are the good aspects of this communist regime when it's, when it's gone? Well, first of all, it was a revolutionary project, a project of a far-reaching transformation of social relations, of the society in general, society, economy, and culture. And as every revolution... It was, or they were, because there were many communist regimes, and let me just restrict myself to the, to the European theater. I'm fairly ignorant about uh, China or Vietnam. But the fact that after the Second World War, Stalin did not incorporate countries of Central and Eastern Europe into the Soviet Union, but rather preferred to establish a set of satellite states, the external empire of the Soviet Union, following the Mongolian model of the, from the interwar period, rather than incorporating names like the Baltic states into the, into the Soviet Union, uh, produced with certain delay uh, uh, in a communist diversity of policies, solutions, uh, uh, and histories, which is useful for, for comparative research. Uh, thesis in political science, in, in social sciences, in, in economy, and especially uh, to test solutions that uh, are related to uh, the role of the state. Because a key feature of, the, of, of communism as a civilization, because that was more than a than a type of, of, of government, is the expansion of the state, which follows the, 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 the great motto of Italian fascists, you know, everything by the states, everything in the state, and nothing outside the state. That was not just the intention, but that was the inner tendency of the regime to expand control up to a certain moment. And actually, I think we can, we can divide the history of the, of the European communist regime into two phases of the expansion of the state control, or someone can call it totalitarization. So, are not necessarily governed by the state, regulated by the state, and reported by the state, were regulated, monitored, and reported in, in, in communist states. Uh, finally, because all these papers, documents, were part of public administrations, be it police or the Communist Party, which formally was not a part of the state, but it de facto was. When the communist regimes ended, they remain in the public archives. 
this is important. And when the archives were open, and in most of the post-communist countries, they were made accessible to historians, we have these documents available, and in, in some cases, relatively well organized now, 30 years later, after the collapse of this, of this, of this regime. So, for example, in Poland, we have masses of the, some 100 kilometers of shelves of uh, security police archives at the Institute of National Remembrance, which is a lot of paper, but you know, increasingly digitized and, and uh, orderly uh, available to, to scholars. And uh, I know that my friends from Western Europe are quite jealous that I have access to the kinds of documents that will not be accessible in France or Great Britain for the next 50 years, for example. And because we had a revolution, it, it's available, so I think this is quite unique opportunity for, for historians. Uh, on the material aspect of it, because since I worked in the museum, I, 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 I pay much more attention to the material aspects of the sources. You know, the sources are having a scan of a document, a photocopy of a document is not the same as seeing the document, the materiality of the paper, how it looks, you know, uh, what you can find in addition to the a line of, of letters on it is important. So communist regimes in Europe coincided with the era of high paper bureaucracy, the era of typewriter, typewriting machine. Since 1970s, electric, before, mechanical, and it greatly improved, I will show you in a second, the striking difference between documents produced in the late 40s, early 50s, before this um, uh, um, um, large bureaucracies acquired typewriting machines, the, the handwriting of, of the poorly educated, um, uh, civil servants um, is, is not very much legible, but uh, since early 1950s, it's improving with, with the typewriter. Of course, communist regimes as a communication systems, they had a number of deficiencies for us. So for example, there was no freedom of speech, there was no free media to report from various perspectives on the, on the, on the same topic. This is a, a, a deficiency which is difficult to avoid. Second, in all these bureaucracies, obviously the lower level bureaucrats had certain tendency, for example, to inflate their success and minimize their failures or simply avoid um, failures. So there, is, there are certain um, uh, tendencies, not just individual proclivity to say or not say something, but tendency inherent for, for bureaucracy that, that affect this kind of sources. But uh, historians are, are used to, to critical approach to, to sources, and when reading communist era documents, we have to keep it in mind, and secret police on the, or the communist party or uh, uh, state administration had particular common features. And in fact, Communist leaders, uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not by just an incident that we have parallel channels of communication, gathering data and channeling them up to the leaders. Because the leaders did not trust any single of the sources. And a skillful communist apparatchik tended to rely, knew one has to rely on various sources of information. In addition to these official documents, uh, a most interesting collection of documents from the communist era are uh, letters and complaints. Party committees, newspapers, television, uh, all kinds of organizations had special sections, bureaus for letters uh, and complaints, and citizens were encouraged to write such letters because that was a, uh, an acceptable form of criticism of specific problems, not a general problem, but a specific problem, and uh, in fact, uh, reproducing the power relations between the subject and the ruler. The subject humbly requesting the party or local government or the central government to improve something or to change something. And this is a very interesting, a very interesting collection of documents uh, in terms of, of migration studies the passport office, the Ministry of Home Affairs, and the party gathered systematically requests and complaints from people who were not given passport for this reason or another. And this is interesting also, uh, the, the, the literary style these people use and what they believe to be most effective. Also, also reporting uh, uh, there were strategies of reporting. 
uh, what I have realized that some people who wanted their message to reach the audience were sending via different channels similar message to various institutions. So in, even in case a bureaucrat cuts the information, denies information to his or her superiors, there is still a chance that, that it may go. So we can develop uh, methodologies of, of um, reading these this documents and make them useful. Uh, and let me give you now the example of the passport questionnaires. Uh, that was the material I was working on. Uh, it's in Polish, I will give you, you, you don't need to read. Uh, it's been evolving since the uh, late 1940s, throughout 1950s, and then uh, a model which remained since 1960s, practically to the end, is this one. You can see uh, four pages. Uh, one, two, three, four, a place for the, a place for the photograph here, name, first name, parents' name, uh, date of birth, regular information which you expect, education, um, do you belong to any social or political organizations, where are you registered, the residence registration, current address, previous address in the last two years, uh, what is important? Have you ever been refused your passport? Uh, what is your family abroad? Who, who is your spouse? Quite detailed information about your spouse, about your children, if they are going abroad, and so on. So you have a, quite an extensive sociological question about the applicant uh, going across these four pages. And for me, the most interesting was this one. You have an em empty half page, and there is an instruction here that if you believe that there is an important information that has not been addressed in previous points, please write it here. And only after, you know, I realized the psychological sophistication of this very open question, because the question, what do you think you should not hide from us? When I read the protocols of the, um, the Collegium of the Ministry of Home Affairs, when the senior security officers gathered to approve this questionnaire, in the early 1960s, and then old security officers, you know, with much experience dating back to the 1940s and 50s, insisted on leaving much space here rather than putting specific questions. And I, I, I would love one day to, to see a book about what people were writing in this, in this field. So it was simple, but it produced, you know, multiplied by thousands and hundreds of thousands and usually millions of applications, because before each trip abroad to a certain moment, and later on each trip outside of the Soviet bloc, one had to fill this questionnaire again and again, which was to update the information, but also to check for consistency. Do you always write the same, for example, what are your relatives abroad? Uh, which I understood reading my own passport files many years later, some 15 years ago, when I found the marks by the security officer with red pencil marking my uncle in England um, who, who didn't return after the Second World War back to Poland, he, who settled in England. And I was given the passport in 1984, that was, and only reading my file, what came to my mind that they asked me about my uncle. I was asked to go to room number six in the, in the local passport office, and there was a man in civilian clothes who asked me, yes, your name, first name, who is your uncle? And my uncle had just a grocery shop in Manchester. But I'm pretty sure that if my, my, if my uncle was an engineer with a major British company, I, they wouldn't let me off the hook so easily. So in, in this case, it passed, but, but otherwise, I was providing important information to the security service, not someone else was reporting on me. And now when you multiply it by millions of applications, what you see at the end is 60 kilometers of passport files. If you put it on a single shelf, the shelf goes from here to Bratislava, roughly speaking, right? So a mass of paper, it was the basic source of information for the security service. Each time security officers wanted to know something about the person, the first request they were sending to the passport office, do you have this and this person in your files? And the answer was yes, no, and then they provided. So quite, quite an important source of information produced by the citizens themselves, on themselves and their relatives, husband, wife, children, 
especially relatives abroad, plus this unclear other important information they provided on the basis of their judgment, what they should not hide from, 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 from the police. So, of course, there was a gigantic work of gathering this information. In fact, security service rarely used most of them. Most of the information was never used and actually is waiting for, for its research to this, to this um, uh, moment. Uh, now let me uh, just, uh, well, this is a kind of an early table about uh, uh, travel abroad. You can see it's written by hand, uh, sometimes not very legible. Later on, there were, um, there were little booklets produced every year by the passport office for the minister, for the Politburo, for the senior apparatchiks in the Central Committee of the Communist Party, detailing how many people went to what country, for how long and for what reasons, who did not return in time, and so on. So that was quite detailed. Uh, now you, you have the map of Poland, uh, but b before I explain why, uh, let me explain why I believe migrations are especially interesting. There are many social phenomena which you can research with this kind of data. But I think migrations are interesting because they are at the intersection of various social forces, demographic, social, political, economic, cultural changes, which you see when trying to understand why some people leave or tried to leave and, and their neighbors did not try, did not want, never wanted. And others were more mobile than, 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 than one was more mobile than, than, than another. So they speak we study migrations because migrations are important social phenomenon today. Uh, actually, there is a fast expanding uh, domain of migration studies. I think now we have at least five major international journals for, for migration studies. It's mostly about current migrations and for good reasons, you know, including now during the war in Ukraine, one of the, one of the major uh, products of this war is mass flow of the, of the refugees. But, uh, uh, but also in economic migrations, different kind of mobilities are under studies, which, which has produced a, a quite impressive body of theoretical uh, scholarship. That means we have conceptual instruments to better understand migrations of the past, and I will come back to this in a, in a few uh, minutes. Uh, one more note uh, about the definition of the term migration. You know, historically and up to the recently, even in the definition, United Nations definition of migration. Migration was a relatively long relocation across a national border. It's three months or more. So short-term migrations were between three months and, uh, and 12 months, and long-term migration lasted more than a year. However, when researching Polish migrations back in the 1990s with, with my colleagues, we, re we have realized that there is a, there are certain phenomena which do not qualify as migrations because they are short term, they qualify as mobility, but they have the same function. Economically, they have same social or very similar consequences. So it, I, I, I use a, a, a broader definition of, of, of migration, which is in fact transborder mobility, mobility transcending the, the borders of the state, which either lasts more than three months or have an economic purpose, which is to exclude tourism, exclude leisure. Uh, when we think about, when we think about uh, the history of the Polish migrations and the migration broadly understood, the mobility across the national borders of, of communist Poland, you know, if we knew only about the migration, if we could see Poland from a bird's eye perspective and see the changing mobility, we would have immediately realized that something dramatic was happening in the late 1940s and then in early 1950s. Because between 1944 and 1948, Poland was the place of the massive, actually biggest in its history, forced migrations. The major group were Germans deported across the western border, first fleeing before the Soviet army, then deported. Then uh, various groups of people deported during the war, mostly as slave labor to Germany, prisoners of war, prisoners of, of concentration camps, coming back to Poland from, from the west. Then those who were allowed to leave the Soviet Union, ethnic Poles and Polish Jews, pre-war Polish citizens who were allowed to resettle from the territories annexed to the Soviet Union, and here you have the map 
This is the territory annexed to the Soviet, Lithuania, Belarus, and, and Ukraine, and mostly moving to the territory annexed to Poland from, from uh, Germany. So these are millions. In a relatively short period, you have a really massive population movement, and then it abruptly ends. In the early 1950s, it's almost nothing. So for example, in the year 1950, only now 9,000 passports were issued in a country of 25 million people. And almost all of them were for business trips of party or state officials to other communist countries. There were, as far as I remember, only 1,800 trips outside of the Soviet bloc in a country of 25 million people. So I believe that this is the moment of the lowest international mobility in Polish history ever and certainly in relation to the, to the country population. It was almost nil for private trips in 1952, because for, I, I didn't find data for all the years. But in 1952, only 50 people were granted private passports for a travel outside of the Soviet bloc. Okay, it doesn't mean that there were no people willing to go abroad. And I will come back to this in a second, speaking about the limits of control. But what is also interesting about this border of Poland? If you see... So this is, this is Poland in the pre-war borders, and this is Poland in the post-war borders. If you have a look on it, only two sections of the pre-war border remained. Most of the Polish border was a new border. All the border with Germany, half of the border with Czechoslovakia, all the border with the Soviet Union, except this little section, the border with Belarus, and of course, the border with the Soviet Union here in the former East Prussia. And this is important because establishing the border, then fortifying the border, establishing the system of border control, the control of the human mobility across the border, was, the, was a part of state building or a rebuilding. So formally it was Poland, but it was very different to the pre-war Poland. And we see it, how different uh, it, its, its borders were, uh, which also made the establishment and the fortification of these borders similar to what the Soviet government was doing on its new Western border. And we have interesting research by our French colleague how much Soviet Union invested in building a whole system preventing illegal border crossing. Uh, it was legitimated as a wall against Western spies coming to the Soviet Union, but as we know in practice it was mostly to prevent exit from these um, countries. So in between 1939 and 1955, we have, well, first, 1944 to 48, we have the period of the highest international migrations across Polish borders. And then, 48, 49 to 55, we have the period of the lowest migration across Polish borders. And how, what happened that in the first period, you have masses of people moving and they, then they don't move? And this is the combination of the passport system and the border control system. Both of them were imitation of the Soviet system. Actually, as many as 40% of the officers of the border guards, which was a militarized on the model of NKVD uh, border troops, uh, uh, so-called border protection troops, 40% of the officers were Soviet officers, which actually was the proportion higher than in the Polish Communist Army at that time. It was as high as in the security uh, ministry. And in fact, these, the border guard made part of the Ministry of Public Security. So we have an imitation of the Soviet model in both aspects, and both are necessary. That means without effective border control, a restrictive migration policy doesn't work because people just cross the border illegally. So how it was that only a few thousand people applied for, for, for an exit permit, for a passport, and only a small proportion of them received it? Uh, I was investigating because I, I realized from the data in the coming years that the number of applicants was decreasing very fast. Initially, it was relatively high. In 1947, 80, it was still relatively high. And then it radically decreased. And the answer is bureaucratic. Namely, it was to make the, the clerks working at the passport office, the civilian employees, and the officers of the passport office enemies of the applicant. So first one could apply for a passport only in one office in Warsaw. So someone living in, in Lower Silesia had to travel you know, the whole night just to submit his or her application. Before submitting application, one had to get the passport questionnaire 
Again, in one place in Warsaw, one could request it by mail, but such request should come with a justification. Why do you want to apply for a passport? So there was kind of a pre-request to the passport. Then the, 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 the officers, first it was checked for the formalities, you know, the stamp, was the fee paid, is the, is the picture clear, and so on. Is anything missing? And then the first lowest level security officer was reading the documents and proposing a positive or a negative decision. If he proposed a negative decision, it was over. But if he proposed a positive decision, his decision was reviewed by a senior officer, then it was sent to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. If there was a positive consultation with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, they sent the documents to the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Party Aptarachik read it for the fourth time. And if they, if they didn't like it, they could return it. If they liked it, it was reaching a special commission of top party leaders. So you have a request for passport read five times, and bureaucrat at each level knows that it will be read again by someone. If he says no, nobody will question the decision. Only positive the question, decision may be question, questioned. And you know, this, they make this decision against a continuous campaign for vigilance. That was the main slogan for all the employees of the Ministry of Public Security, vigilance. You know, vigilance for traitors, spies, and so on. So uh, this explains why so few of the requests were eventually approved. But also the declining number of the requests was rational because people knew first that they must approach the Minister of Public Security and no reasonable person was approaching the Minister of Public Security without very good reason at that time. And second, that the probability of being successful is so low that maybe it doesn't make sense to apply because the act of application is almost a treason, especially as one wants to go to you know, Western imperialists who are enemies of socialism and enemies of, of Poland. So there was a social process behind the declining number of applications and eventually also declining number of approved applications because the officers, all the chain of the bureaucrats screening the, the documents have to show that they are vigilant. Even if the number of applications was 10% of the, of, the, of the figure three years before, they still had to reject the majority of them. So you have an unending process which would eventually, you know, which ended with these 50 passports given in, in 1950. 1952. Uh, second is the system of border control. And here you have, uh, this is actually a propaganda colorful photograph of, of joyful uh, soldiers of the border protection troops. You have the Polish Western border. And they have something which is typical for all the communist countries, uh, a belt of raked soil to see the footprints of anyone crossing. And, and that was cleared regularly. And to make it a kind of a, a, a UNESCO type of story, you had such a belt also on the beaches of the Baltic Sea. So uh, border protection troops were raking the sand of the Baltic Sea to see if anyone was crossing. Only some of the beaches were accessible to the public and in some hours before, that, uh, only on, on daylight. The, uh, the, the rivers were, were blockaded. So incredible investment of, of time and money. Um, I didn't find a good picture of Polish uh, barbed wire fence, but 1,200 kilometers of barbed wire were erected all along the western border, partially the, the sea border and a, a part of the border with, uh, with Czechoslovakia, plus more than 1,000 of watchtowers. There is an old joke that Poland was the most funny barrack in the socialist camp. And it, it wasn't just a metaphor. The fact that you can see one watchtower from another makes it look like a, like, a, like a camp. And here you have the two ends of the story. One is the book for the children, soldiers of the border protection troops and the little boys and their dog. And the story is how they fi can find a spy trying to destroy their the beloved homeland. And this, this picture, you can, you can one of the victims, not of the Polish border fence, but the Czechoslovak border fence at the border between Czechoslovakia and Germany. The fence was under high voltage. 
So at least I have found a report about 42 Poles identified as victims at this, at this border. And this comes to a, this comes to a, a point about the limits of control, which is, yes, you can effectively block our migration. Because in a few years, the number of emigrants was reduced to almost zero, including the number of illegal escapees. We have detailed statistics from the border protection troops. They were measuring it. How many items they have noted, such as footprints on this, on this belt? What was the proportion of apprehended escapees? Uh, what it turned out that the, what was most difficult to cross was not the fence, but the zone. That means the fact that Poland didn't have a border with a non-communist country. Those who escaped from Poland across the fence, you know, uh, bypassing the watchtowers and, 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 and the border guards, had to cross East Germany or Czechoslovakia to reach the first non-communist place, or to cross the Baltic Sea to, to Bordholm, the Danish island in the Bordholm. So space, if, you, if one day you are an autocrat of a country or you are a commissioner of the European Union, I would like to prevent illegal migration. Zones are much more effective than fences. It's much easier to dug in under or fly above, as we know from the story of, of, of the Berlin Wall. So it was effective. I suppose that no more than a couple of hundred people could illegally leave Poland, you know, hidden in ships or otherwise which is almost nothing. Comparing to the number of people who very likely would love to leave communist Poland of the early 1950s, the, 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 the Stalinist period. In fact, there is abundant information about big effort, efforts made to apprehend anyone. I have found a story about two teenagers who were trying to escape from Poland in a kayak to Bornholm. More than 2,000 people were mobilized, several airplanes, to catch them up, and they did. You know, thinking about it, I realized that the objective was not so much to find who was in the kayak, but to make an escape impossible, and then impossible even to consider, unimaginable. And here we come to Alberto Hirschman's great book on exit voice and loyalty. Alberto Hirschman was a political scientist who wrote about different forms of behavior in organizations, be it companies or, or polities. And he, uh, in particular, he found two ways of responding to organizations, including states, that one may not like for some reason. One is voice, is a critique, articulating the critique. That means an attempt to change it. Second is exit, if we don't like something in a, Merlin shop, for example, at present, we can leave it and go to another shop. And emigration is exactly such form of expressing discontent by leaving a country. The third part of this, of this uh, equation is loyalty. That means loyalty not necessarily as a certain sentiment we have, but the fact of attachment that we remain loyal to, it, to our organization. So I believe that reducing to almost to zero the possibility of exit and reducing the possibility of voice, that is the public criticism of, of communist Poland, Polish communists didn't leave much choice but what uh, Marx called uh, freedom. That means to recognize uh, the necessity of adaptation to the communist regime. And I think that was, I've never found it articulated, but the readiness to mobilize 2,000 people to catch up two teenagers in a kayak shows how important it was. In these stories, there were two exceptions. Two exceptions, uh, a very strange couple, that is Germans and Jews. Uh, in 1949 and then in 1950, the government two exceptions for ethnic Jews and ethnic Germans in communist Poland which was a follow-up to the ethnic unmixing of 1940s, where Jews were deported. Actually, uh, Germans were deported. Actually, Jews were the only group allowed both to immigrate to Poland and to leave Poland. 
Germans, Lithuanians, Belarusians, Ukrainians were not allowed to return to Poland and they were deported from Poland. Poles were welcome back to Poland but not allowed to emigrate. And only the Jews can move in and out. Uh, moreover, in 1948-1949, there emerged two new states, the State of Israel in 1948 and German Democratic Republic in 1949. And these two governments separately requested Polish government to allow for family reunification. And they had good reason. There were many families divided by, by war and, and post-war migrations. So, so the government made two exceptions. One was so-called Israeli option, the option given to Polish Jews to choose the homeland, Israel or Poland, 1949-1950, and some 28, up to 30,000 people emigrated. And a similar, uh, uh, similar program for ethnic Germans, allowing them to leave for East Germany, although at that time, as you know, there was not yet a Berlin Wall. So I, I understand that some of them crossed cross the, the German-German border and emigrated. And, uh, both programs were restricted. That means one had to prove one is a Jew or a German, in organized transports with special documents and restricted in time. So uh, actually, before leaving, all the emigrants had to apply for the permission to change the citizenship. Sorry for the long term. They were not deprived of citizenship, but they had to request the permission to be deprived of citizenship. And they were leaving Poland with documents, so-called travel documents. Uh, let me show it like this one. This is the only document I know which states that the bearer of this document is not a citizen of People's Poland. The only document which states whom you are not rather than whom you are. And they, they were living with such passports or, or, or group passports. Uh, otherwise, you can see the transition from pre-communist Poland to communist Poland. This is the pre-war passport. Some of them were still in use after the Second World War you can see the crown. Later on, the crown disappears. Up to 1952, uh, when Poland changed its name into the People's Republic of Poland, there was still the, this name. So there were, the change was gradual. Actually, some of the pure regulations were, were in use up to early 1950s. Uh, so this is the story of a restriction. And then it changed. Uh, I'm not, I cannot devote as much time as as I have devoted to the period of restriction to the, to the much longer period of, of the opening. So after Stalin's death and the Tau in the, in the Soviet Union, gradually Polish communists, and really, really gradually, and very cautiously, began the opening of the borders. And again, it started with Germans and Jews under the pressure of the two governments. Actually, Germans were using the stick and carrot of trade relations. There were no diplomatic relations between West Germany and Poland, but, but Germany were using the carrot and stick of, of, of beneficial trade. And uh, actually, Israeli government already in 1949, 1950 was paying for every Jewish emigrant. So they were paying. Later on, they were also paying to the government of communist Romania. But I think more important was certain confusion of Polish communists in 1955, 56, especially after the, the Khrushchev famous uh, secret speeches. What is the Stalinist excess in migration restriction? And what is the justified Leninist policy on migration? Lenin didn't write very much about international migration. And one had actually to invent what is proper. So they were testing the ground. And in 56, because of political destabilization, that was actually a, a state of chaos. I suppose also corruption. I didn't find any evidence, but I found a document when the senior party apparatchik was coming to the to a, to a conference in the Ministry of, of Home Affairs when you have these officers from the passport office saying, comrades, we have the family reunification program for, for the Jews, uh, but anyone who's going to Israel doesn't need to have a family in Israel. So you can join a family you don't have in Israel also. Uh, it seems that in late 1956, the government actually lost control. Communist leaders were busy with in, intra-party uh, uh, faction struggle. And with the decentralization of decision-making from this highly centralized system only in Warsaw to the regional, provincial um, uh, police uh, uh, offices, uh, it seems they lost control. So in total, in 56 to 59, uh, almost 350,000 people left Poland, mostly two-thirds of them to Germany 
some 50,000 people left for, for Israel. And then beginning 57, 58, uh, we can see a restabilization, which is not a return to the Stalinist policy. Actually, it's a, it's a deep reform of thinking about migration to make it not impossible, but selective. We see the expansion of the bureaucracy of the passport office, no longer with the Minister of Public Security, but all the time a part of the, of the security service. We see its bureaucratization in terms of the growing number of regulations. Uh, officers and officials are given specific instructions. So there is a, this is what was called at that time socialist rule of law, praworządność. In fact, it was socialist rule by law because the Politburo could decide anything. It was not bound by any constitutional regulation, nothing. They could do anything. But the lower level apparatchik and officers had to follow certain, certain regulations, and they did it. And we see it for stabilizing, then developing, and eventually expanding the whole system of managing much bigger movement than in the early 1950s. So roughly from 1960 to 1980, we have the golden era of the, of the so-called really existing socialism in Poland with its own migration uh, policy and migration institutions. And let me just mention three aspects of it. First, speaking about long-term immigration, which in 99% of cases was permanent immigration. If someone was allowed to leave, very few people returned. Some people did from Israel, from Germany, from elsewhere, but, 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 but very few people returned. So it was about between 15 and 30,000 people annually, almost exclusively on the basis of family relations. And we know from secret instructions that those who are sick, elderly, or a problem, criminals, for example, they had much greater chances to get an exit permit. If one was educated, male, living in a big city, employed in an industry, the probability of, of getting exit permit radically decreased. So this is about long-term immigration. From time to time, there were bilateral agreements with West German government allowing for two waves of immigrations in the early 1970s and in the late 1970s. Again, Germany paid for those people. First, it paid with the recognition of other nice as the western border of Poland in 1970, and then it paid with one billion Deutschmarks in 1975 after the agreement at the, actually during the Helsinki conference, there was a conversation between the party leader Gierek and the German chancellor, and they agreed for, for some 125,000 people to, to, to emigrate. However, however, just allowing people to live is not enough. People need to want to live. And of course, living in a communist Poland, having an option to migrate to much richer, wealthier, more free West Germany, there were many reasons to go. However, what they found that the, maybe not, not the key factor, but a key factor to explain the dynamics of migration are networks, social networks, which actually send us back to the basis of the communist regime. Namely, the communist project was to abolish capitalism and make the capitalist as a class disappear. However, on the reading list of the communist leaders, there was no Bourdieu. They understood capital in a very narrow terms as economic capital. So there were few capitalists in Poland indeed. But there were many people with social capital. And this capital proved to be the most important one. A joke from the 1960s used to say that what is the most horrible punishment you can get in Poland is living 10 years without connections. So knowing people who can help you Having ties, strong ties, weak ties, speaking sociologically, which are your social capital, were crucial for arranging of plenty of things, including making career, getting an apartment, and going abroad. Finding a job, getting a visa of, of the destination country, and so on. So uh, I think the fact that this kind of capital was not abolished as the economic capital was, made it the most important capital that citizens of communist countries could have. And of course, it, it was convertible, converted into cultural capital and again and again, but still that was the most important thing. But it, is a, it had a consequence, namely, if your personal relations to various people are so important, 
And some of these relations are transnational. They reach abroad. You have a cousin or a friend in Germany, in England, France, or in Israel, or in the United States, in Chicago. It's an asset. You cultivate it. You write letters. You receive a dollar or a Deutschmark. But when members of your family start to emigrate, and suddenly, out of the 10 members of, the, of your family, four are living in Germany, and the fifth person is living, suddenly, the center of gravity of your social capital relocates abroad. And then, to exploit your social capital, you, go, you follow them. So the inner logic of the local, geographic location of the social capital made people moving. And we can see it very well in the passport office reports for the party leaders. During these programs for ethnic Germans, the party leadership each time was allowing for emigration of a given number of people on the assumption that these are the irritating ethnic Germans who identify with West Germans. It's better to get rid of them because they hinder development of, of, of socialism in Poland. And they always believe that if they let, let's say, 50,000 people go, the problem will be over. It was the reverse. With every person living for Germany, there were two people applying for a passport. That means someone who went to live with his cousin in Germany was, beca was becoming someone else's cousin in Germany, or in Israel, or in America, or elsewhere. So the, the history of the social capital and its geographic relocation for me is crucial. Uh, third is the temporary mobility. And we can see it already in 1956 with masses of Poles visiting the Soviet Union, not only to visit the homelands. They left in 1944-45 when they were deported to, to, to Poland because of, of, of the border change. Initially, this is what they did. But increasingly, they go there to buy and sell. They exploit disparities in prices and also disparities in availability or quality of the project, products available in various communist countries. And in, already in the early 1960s, custom officers estimated that most of the participants of organized tourist groups and the large percent of officials going on a business trip or people going to visit their family were engaged in the petty trade. What well, we call it petty trade, but when you multiply it by millions of trips abroad, it's no longer petty. The source of profit of these operations was not only in the market disparities, but also, and especially when these people were taking some job abroad, in the exorbitant uh, black market exchange rate of so-called hard currencies, American dollars, uh, West German Deutschmark, or, or British pound. Uh, to give you an example, when I did it in 1987 as a student, when I worked illegally in New York as a waiter, my father engineer monthly salary was equivalent of $35 monthly. And I returned with $10,000. So I was a billionaire from this point of view. So the mechanism of the black market exchange actually relied on the policy of the government, which I will explain to you in my next paper. I don't have any more time for it. If you want to learn more about it, uh, these are the passports I wanted to show you. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, you can read my book in Polish or some of the articles on specific topics. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dariusz, for those of us who have lived in this system. Uh, it brought back very many bad memories. <laughs> Uh, Ranabir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Professor Stola, for this. You know, I learned a lot. And uh, so, therefore, it was an uh, enriching, uh, you know, experience for me. And uh, I must admit at the outset that my knowledge of Poland and Polish migration is, I mean, Knowledge of Poland is little more, but knowledge on Polish migration is nil. So uh, if you find that what I say now is nonsense, blame it on my dear friend Ludger, who requested me to offer some comments. But if you find something substantive, put it on me. Then don't direct it to that. No now, in that spirit, uh, Professor Stoller, I would offer some comments, obviously not on the technical details of what you have 
said, but thank you also for sending the paper in, you know, the earlier published paper in advance. Uh, so I can only share with you and to you all members of the audience the kind of thoughts that emerged in my mind. So not necessarily, uh, you know, engaging with the technicalities or the historical details that you have presented, but uh, for someone who works in the area of migration studies and a little bit of other allied issues, what are the kinds of thinking that I, uh, you know, that uh, came to my mind? One is, of course, I was very interested and at the same time it triggered a series of thoughts, again, which I can't go into details, is this, this reference to Hirschman's, uh, you know, exit voice and loyalty. Uh, because it, le it may lead to a different sense of reason through the entire account that you have presented, which, as I say, was enriching for me. In the sense that can one uh, renegotiate or reimagine the relation between loyalty and exit? But I can understand that when you are exiting, uh, this is like voting with your own feet, that this is your saying, this is my judgment of the society, and precisely by leaving, I give the judgment. On the other hand, if you turn Hirschman's argument, which is a classic rational economic argument, on its head, you may argue, and my series of comments will be on that line, that if it is the case which it is, which you have presented, that Poland, like other socialist countries, where the state wanted to be a society, uh, uh, coterminous with society, consider it as a kind of a hermetically sealed entity called Poland or for that matter, other countries. And then if you think of the, uh, let's say, old cynic groups on which Foucault in fact makes a very interesting comment that how revolutionary groups from the late 19th century in strange ways, not consciously perhaps, started imitating some of the uh, protocols of the, of, the, of the Greek cynics in the sense that once you have developed certain uh, codes of how to lead life and you seal your community, then uh, exit actually shows that you are disloyal. So it is producing the whole r relation between exit voice and loyalty in a, in a different way. And from that angle, I will not go into details, but all I can say is that interesting historical works uh, have appeared uh, along uh, the lines of uh, this kind of Foucauldian comments, which I am not wrong, probably he made uh, this uh, fascinating a few uh, suddenly intervening remarks in course of one of his lectures, possibly titled as the government of the living, but it could be any other series of Collège de France lectures, given I think around 1980 or 81. And then these revolutionary sects, whether they have come to state power or not, think of the terrorist societies as in India. I was thinking of the, uh, our colonial time, where you have the opportunity or you have the freedom in a way to enter, but you don't have the opportunity to, uh, the license to go out, because going out would be declaring your uh, your act of disobedience. All the more uh, because once you have agreed or once the, uh, the, 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 the society thinks that these are the agreed protocols of leading one's life or our collective life, then as the cynics would have said that there must be compelling protocols to oppose any kind of pleasure that acts as a fault line of the society. So typically as in India, and much of your accounts uh, didn't uh, seem strange to me, because many of these things were in practice in India even, the, even let's say 10 years back. I'll, I'll just mention one or two so that everyone will be humored a bit about after the serious thing, where uh, the fact that you want to go abroad, particularly to wealthy countries, is, an, is, is, is a declaration that you want leisure. 
and that you want pleasure. And travel is very much connected with this whole idea of pleasure, particularly when the state or the society claims that your work is guaranteed, that your life is guaranteed, that you are not an un unemployed labor, that this was capitalism's curse, and this is what we have done. So why do you need it? There are accounts and accounts of these things, but I'm, I'm saying that this is one kind of thinking. The other is, of course, uh, something that comes uh, through your account is that finally again, and uh, carrying forward the Foucauldian argument a little more, that migration politics at the end of the day, besides what you have said, is also population politics at its purity. It is how do you manage population, how do you control population. But managing population to what end? This is where you could say that finally, even when it is a socialist state, it, it, its, its claim or its destiny is to become a nation state. And given that kind of uh, providence uh, 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 that is there, you want to have precisely through the, uh, through the re reframing of the boundaries, the remaking of the, of the territory of the state, that you want the right kind of size to be appropriate to what you might call the right kind of population. And the right kind of population is not merely that ethnically it has to be right. So clearly, uh, you allow a nice exit to Germans, you allow a nice exit to Polish Jews, etc. But on the other hand, it's also true that the right kind, meaning that it has to be, in that sense, loyal, socialist, ideal, you know, Stakhanovite kind of thing with whom you can make the models of your future generation. So how does a nation state then achieve this uh, combination of what uh, the state would think that it must have the right kind of population and the right kind of thing. And that brings me to my two more comments. One is that what I found interesting in your uh, in in the paper that you sent and to which you made mention but you didn't get the time as you said to the last part that how the police state uh, changed and and reframed its policies again since i'm a bit cynic as you may have found out by now and i throw my hands up and admit i again would say it's not an exception uh, from two angles. One is this classic dictum of, let us say, Cicero, who had said that the mixed form of governance is the ideal government. So if you have an ideal democracy, that is bad. If you have ideal monarchy, pure monarchy, that is bad. If you have pure aristocracy, bad. And actually, all successful governments go through the process of a mixture of these three types in his words, and then you arrive. So therefore, you allow a historical trajectory to go. So as you were explaining, uh, and let me refer, you know in India, even 20 years back when I was doing my own research in, uh, in 1997, 90, let's say 25 years, on Bangladesh-India migration, I discovered I didn't know that India had, after 50 years of independence, had a special passport called the Bangladeshi passport, which means that it's typically like your, your meaning, the cases that you mentioned, that if you want to travel within the socialist bloc, within uh, or to USSR, you have a special kind of passport. And for India, the logic was, in fact, with Pakistan for 20 years, it was the case that these are near abroad. These are our neighbors. They belong to our spiritual community, even though we had a partition. But nonetheless, we all belong to a community which is only of a recent past, maybe 20, 30 years. So we had this special passports where the demands were less. You could apply quickly and typically like the Bangladeshi passport which you had or in the older case East Pakistan passport. So you had this whole system that you quickly apply, you get it and you return it. But the fact that you had exactly as you have mentioned is fascinating that you had to return your thing. So it leads to and again it's not unique and with which I shall end my comment. Is passport then an identity document or a document of travel? Now the question that you raise, again, when you were showing uh, you know, all these things, uh, the different uh, photographs of, uh, of passports, one of course is whole kind of an 
phenomenological inquiry that how come travel is related to your identity, f apart from a bare thing. But the fact is that travel is always related to identity. There is no history of travel that had been free of the burdens of identity. For coming here, as all of the IWM staff and you know, that I had to fill in three pages of the visa requirement. Uh, fortunately, I have a passport which is at least will last for 10 years. But this play of identity and, uh, and travel, the two requirements which seem to be different, Till the other day when we didn't have the unique identity system which now we have the Aadhaar card, uh, the identity card, the passport was the supreme form of identity even within the country when I'm not traveling. But that seemed to be. That brings me to the last point and this is where uh, I hope that this wonderful, you know, this uh, presentation and the material that you are working on that it uh, uh, shed light on that. The, the same dynamics or, or in other words this compulsion to create a hermetically sealed society, does it operate in today's time or was it something special to communist Poland? My submission would be it operates today across things. Take the entire journey of Frontex, ironically probably headquartered in Warsaw. And again, take the duties that Frontex has been mandated with to do, you will see that again there is the same agenda that this society called Europe must be protected from outside. It must be sealed from outside. So the investigation of how do we regulate the movement of people to go outside, emigration, and how do we regulate a society which will regulate people from coming in, in coming in? They are apparently two different trajectories, but they are extremely closely linked. And this is where my comment would be, it's, I understand it's a bit ironic comment, but this is where the kind of wealth of material that you presented, you know, raised in my the immediate query, how is it in any way different? How is it in any way different from, let's say, some of the practices that, uh, that um, you know, modern states, post-communist states or other states do? Uh, when I first filled in my visa form from, for going to United States, one of the things that I, I'm quite sure you, so, were you ever a member of the Communist Party? Were you involved in communist activities? You had to say, and finally, uh, 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 fantastic your thing about the open space. Today's version of the open space would be that I guarantee or I, that all the information that has been given they are correct and if there is anything in, in, incorrect information the owner says. Thank you, I learned a lot. Thank you, Ranabir. Immediate comment and then uh, we'll open it up. Actually you have raised a number of essential topics. <laughs> uh, l let me start with the particular reasons of communist state to restrict their control, mobility, or the bodily relocation. Communist states were at least declared to be communities of workers, workers only. Going abroad meant depriving your socialist homeland of your labor. And the question, who is the owner of the socialist labor, came explicitly, and I found it in the documents in the early 1970s, where their East German comrades requested Polish comrades in Warsaw that they can recruit workers in border regions of Poland because they, had a, they have a deficiency of labor in East Germany. And initially, Polish government was quite happy because there was a baby boom 20 years before. They were afraid of, uh, of potential for, for unemployment. And also in the border regions, there was a lot of blue-collar female workers who couldn't find employment. So specifically for women with no special skills, the program was open. But then someone raised the question, how, how much the German state should pay the workers and should the German state pay to the Polish government? And there was an elaborate thinking in Marxist terms, which the conclusion basically was that the labor of a socialist citizen is the property of the socialist state. 
which has provided, you know, kindergartens and schools and healthcare and everything. So, in a way, has now a claim. So later on, Germany was paying to the worker and to the state. So it was like, well, borrowing a slave from somewhere. Or they were very well treated, and there were special officials to make sure that there was no discrimination, that they were paid equally with, with East German workers, and so on. But this thinking is that when a body of a socialist citizen goes abroad, it deprives the state of its labor, and this is illegitimate. So this is why sick and elderly could leave. You have this ideal citizen who is young, healthy, educated, skilled worker. So this is, this is one of the reasons of, of keeping. And then I, I, I didn't know that there were the special passports. In all communist states, there were two kinds of passports. In some countries, they were red and blue. Passports for the com socialist community and passports for the, for the rest of the world. I actually had a, a photograph I can show you. In Polish case, all of them were blue. They had just a different name. Oh, this is Kwad Kapasportowa. That was a passport only for socialist states and Yugoslavia. So <laughs> Yugoslavia was on the border. And many people were escaping to Italy from, 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 oh, yeah. from Yugoslavia. Absolutely. Here you can see, this is a regular ID act of my father, actually, with a stamp. This stamp allowed to cross the border to the, East, to the German Democratic Republic since 1972 with regular ID. This stamp allowed for travel inside the European socialist state. So there was a kind of a socialist Schengen zone. Yeah. It didn't last very long, only in the 1970s. It ended with Solidarity Revolution in Poland, but there was something like this. Um, and uh, so even when the labor was to be used by brotherly socialist states, still Polish communists had a problem with it, not to speaking about, about uh, Western capitalists. Certain the evolution, I think the, the, the key aspect of the detotalitarization of the Polish communist regime after 1956 is the expansion of the private sphere. The private sphere as a space where a person um, doesn't have a special duty to the state. When things are private, which was not governed by, by a policy. That was the major victory of 1956 and lasting. And they never actually tried to, to take it back. On the other hand, while in the 19, early 1950s, there was securitization of movement across the borders. All the thinking about it was in security terms. This is why the Minister of Public Security was crucial. In fact, most of the movement across the border was literally Sovietized and militarized because these were the military transports from the Soviet Union to East Germany and the bases of the, of the Red Army in Poland, which made something like 90% of the, of the border movement, or movement in Poland. Uh, the, the question of loyalty, which you, you have mentioned, and leaving, it reminds me of another problem that, that party leaders had, especially in Silesia, which was, if someone was openly German and pro-German, speaking German in public, well, it was very bad. And this way, pushing others to not to hide the attachment to the German culture. Such person had higher probability of getting an exit permit. And here we come to the dilemma, because that was a way of get rid of active, so-called active Germans or conspicuous Germans. But when people learned about it, those who wanted to leave started to conspicuously yeah. know that they are Germans. So that was a never-ending process. Actually, it only stopped in 1990 when the Federal Republic drastically reduced the possibility of migration of ethnic Germans from Poland to Germany because of the masses of ethnic Germans from the Soviet Union. They suddenly started testing, for example, the language skills of this alleged ethnic Germans from Poland, and it turned out that 90% of them speaks no German at all. <laughs> uh, um, finally, uh, what you said about the, uh, yes, instead of filling four pages of passport questionnaire, you have to fill four pages of visa questionnaire. Well, I did it going to the United States, I had to declare. I'm not a member of the Communist Party, and I have no intention of attacking American president. There was, yes, I'm not sure if in other countries, but in Polish, there was a question if am I going to join yeah, the conspiracy. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, Americans learned it already in the early 1980s. Others learned it later that with the liberalization of passport policy in Poland, the burden of mobility control shifted to the destination countries. 
So the easier it was to leave Communist Poland, the more difficult it was to get any Western visa, except for Austria and Sweden, which, which were relatively liberal. So I think the, uh, the, the modern state has a very strong tendency not only to monopolize violence, but also to monopolize the legal means of travel. And this is passport and visa systems. And they don't like very much people who try to cheat or avoid the system and who see it very well. The, the difference between communist countries and, and contemporary Poland or Europe, European Union, is that in the communist era, it was applied mainly to Poland's own citizens. Now, the violence is applied to foreigners, not to let them in. And this is, it has a different logic. It may be justified differently, but it's clearly, it's clearly uh, the, the case. So, first is the violence to restrict the members' mobility. Now is the violence to restrict the non-members' mobility into. Thank you, Darius. Wow, uh, huge questions. Um, Please uh, raise your hand if you want to speak and comment, or in the back first, then here. Let's collect uh, two or three questions. Thank you very much. I have uh, two interrelated questions. You had very vividly drawn the logic, the dynamics of the legal migration from, uh, from Poland, depending on the history of the political of the communist system. But I wonder, and only in passing you have referred to the illegal uh, emigration. So my first question is, does the dynamic of illegal emigration follow exactly the same pattern as the legal migration dependent on the co communist system? Or there are some particular moments uh, that there is some divergence between patterns of legal uh, emigration and illegal emigration? Because in the 50s there is a coincidence that there is a drop in legal emigration and also illegal because of all these things that you said. But maybe uh, before and later there are some divergences. And the second question is what we can learn about the state from these divergences. And the second question here. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you for, for this very timely uh, topic. And I, ha I have two questions. One of them is on uh, the forced mig migration. Uh, we know it's like, well, it's 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 a very kind of you know patent phenomenon of the early communist period. But what about the late communist period? Like especially when it comes to this, uh, are were all the people that were leaving uh, Poland for Germany, or did all of them leave of their own will, <laughs> or not, so to speak? And. Um, then the second question is about the, uh, the, the, you know, like the incoming uh, 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 traffic. You ended up saying that that that's the difference. But is it is it uh, is the research like in uh, on uh, on how was the po policy of of the you know socialist state on kind of regulating the inbound traffic into socialist republics? Okay. Uh, the divergence between legal and illegal streams. Uh, a very good question, actually, because what happened after 1956 when it's much easier to go abroad first to the socialist countries and after Helsinki also to, to non-socialist countries. That means illegal immigration almost disappears. It's much easier to legally leave the country and not return. Mm -hmm. So the question, is it illegal immigration? No. It was illegal, it was, I call it informal or irregular. That means someone lied in the passport application that he or she was going for five weeks to visit family, but, but didn't have intention to, to, to stay abroad, but eventually stood abroad. In fact, not always people had the intention of not returning at the beginning. Some of them were making decisions only, only abroad. So uh, in a way, it's like uh, it, contemporary requests to allow for channels of legal immigration to the European Union, because otherwise the system, the, the, the system of refugee protection is overburned. People have a choice and they try it any way which is accessible. When other ways are closed, they try to arrive as uh, asylum seekers. Because it was possible to leave Poland, for example, for an excursion to Yugoslavia and then illegally cross the border to Italy, there was, actually it was much more cost effective was, and less risky 
uh, and there were elaborate strategies. For example, people who knew that they were unlikely to get emigration permit didn't apply for emigration permit. They were applying for a short visit to Yugoslavia or to somewhere. And so, so in, in, in return, uh, security in, in service developed its own strategies, such as keeping hostages. Never allow a whole family to go for an excursion. Always keep someone. So this, this in the 1980s, this strategy proved ineffective because Palat was under international pressure that it's blocking family reunification. So, in fact, in the 1980s, we see a pattern that first you have, in total it was 800,000 people who live with regular tourist passports. They don't return. And then they demand Poland to release their family members as legal long-term immigrants. So, uh, it's an unending game between the migrants and, and, the, and, the, and the police states, but in a way, relative opening of the border was the best way to prevent illegal immigration, in this sense. Uh, the force, who was forced to emigrate? Yes, most of the people were forced not to emigrate. There were much more, many more doves willing. Annually, usually, except for these few years when there were special programs for the Germans, more than 90% of the applications for immigration to Germany were rejected. But there were moments when the government wanted some people to go. For example, in 1968, after the anti-Zionist campaign, it was for the most loyal former party members of Jewish origin who were forced to leave. Those who were, as I said, conspicuous or ostensible Germans, they were forced to leave. And during the martial law in Poland, there was a special program at the request of General Jaruzelski, who imitated comrade Fidel Castro. I don't know how Jaruzelski learned about Fidel Castro. They call it Marielitos. In 1980, Castro opened the, the, the port, of, port of Mariel to all those who wanted to escape, and thousands of Cuban diaspora came in yachts and boats to take their families. At the same time, Cuban police released criminals from the prisons. So in Poland, it was the same, and we have beautiful reports how members, leaders of the Solidarity, who were interned in prison during the martial law, were offered. You can stay in jail as long as you wish, or you can go to Germany or to the United States or whatever. You will get the easily refugee status or uh, uh, asylum status in these countries. And a few thousand people did, did accept it. And we have some dramatic stories of you know, people who were harassed, threatened, their families were threatened, and eventually they, they, they gave up. But that was a, a, a small minority among the masses, some two million people who emigrated for good from Pol communist Poland, that was to maybe 15% of the total. Questions, comments? Kate. Thank you for this, Darius. This is really fascinating. And I have two questions, one of which is kind of broader conceptual, and then one I'm very curious about some of these documents you're looking at. So the broader question has to do with something that Ranabir pointed to, which is the creation right of a nation state in a certain sense. And in fact, this period of 44 to 48 is a dramatic transformation of the Polish demographics, right, with the changing of the borders and these forced population movements. So I'm wondering to what degree the restriction on movement that follows that also has to do with the emergence of a homogenous society in a certain sense. So to what degree is, as Rana Bear says here, um, the sort of building of a body that is not only a worker's body, a party state, but also a Polish body? To what degree does that play a role here in the Polish case in particular? And then I'm, and of course, the Ukrainians are a huge part of this forced migration story, right? And so the movement of them out of the Polish territories, this is also very much on my mind these days as we're seeing an unprecedented influx of Ukrainians. And then in terms of the documents, I'm very curious, with this open question, what do you, with this open question of what else should we know? What struck you as you were reading through these? What elements, what, what are some through lines, some themes of what people write in that field? And do those change in keeping with how we expect in terms of the political dynamics in Poland at the time? Or are there surprising divergences there? So, uh, first to your second question, 
I, I said that I dream about this research because I never made it. <laughs> Actually, seeing the 60 kilometers of, of, of passport files, I decided I cannot even make the samples. So I was relying on, on, on aggregate data from regional and central passport offices. I read just, I don't know, maybe two dozen of, of this. I was interested in some people. And uh, all kind of comments you can imagine. S -s Something about a cousin who was abroad, but I have no relations with him. I've never, I don't know. No, yeah. There's a beautiful story which I didn't find in the passport documents, but I found in a relation about Bronisław Geremek, the great Polish dissident and, and medi me medieval historian, who survived the war. You know, he was of Jewish origin, so he, for the Nazis he was a Jew. He was in hiding uh, with, 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 a, with a, a, a Christian family, and he believed that his brother was killed during the war. And suddenly, I think it was 1948 or 1949, his brother sent him a letter from Israel. What was the first thing he did? He went to the security office to correct his <laughs> documents <laughs> that he has a brother abroad. Fascinating. Uh, so uh, I mean, it tells a lot about how much of thinking was behind this kind of declarations in, in, in the documents. And regarding the nations, it's a really fascinating story. You know, we, we think that you know, there is a Poland because there is a history of Poland. But Poland 1939 and Poland 1946 is com completely. You know, usually w w what makes a nation, it's a population, territory, political regime, economy, and culture. You have a very different population. You have almost no Jews, no Ukrainians, no Germans, and no landlords, and no capitalists, and so on. No politicians of the Pivo party. You have a com completely different territory. Poland lost almost half of the territory, and the, the German territory is now 30% of the, of, the, of the new territory of the country. With a completely different political regime, a different economic system. So the only thing which was relatively stable was the most fragile culture. And going back to the a kind of a, it's, you know, at, at the crossroads of biopolitics and cultural policy, because how do you understand membership in ethno-nation? And in Polish, Narod has a very strong ethnic meaning. So, in fact, Poland was to, to be made a homogeneous nation-state of Poles. And suddenly, the Jews appeared. Polish Jews in the Soviet Union, specifically. It turned out that the large proportion of uh, Polish citizens in the Soviet interior were Polish Jews, who massively joined the Union of Polish Patriots, established uh, under communist protection in the Soviet Union, very patriotic, and they didn't fit. I suppose behind it was a, was a thinking of the Soviet leadership that they wanted to get rid of these Polish Jews. So they allowed for the immigration. Polish Ukrainians, Polish Lithuanians, Polish Belarusians could not cross the border, new border of Poland. Polish Jews could. And as I said, they also could leave Poland. There was an informal agreement after the Kielce pogrom between the Zionists and the, and the Polish government, communist government, allowing for a really mass, because it was something like 70,000 people who lived in Poland in, in a few months. So these Jews didn't fit. Uh, there was an exception confirming the rule. So they had a little niche. And actually, my colleague who asked me the question, Kamil Kiek, is writing about these little Jewish communities reestablishing in Lower Silesia. But otherwise, there was a dilemma between attracting to Poland as many people to repopulate the territories annexed from Germany and keeping Poland as homogeneous as possible. And uh, navigating between these two demands, what emerged was uh, uh, one of the most culturally most homogeneous countries in Europe. Any final questions? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It actually resonates very deeply in my own experiences because I'm from Czech Republic, former Czechoslovakia. So, and uh, I have actually no question, but uh, uh, two short comments. I, I, I am restricting myself to really be very brief. One is that the, the that, uh, questionnaire to, ish, to receive the visa, we had uh, two very important lines there also. One was state your class origin. 
And this was also critical, uh, where you could lose points. <laughs> and the second was state if you solved uh, your attitude to the religion or to the religious beliefs. And this was also, you know, very, very difficult to, to respond. And uh, so this I wanted to add. Then actually uh, the, the, the passport, of course, some people were denied it and, uh, or confiscated. But uh, mm, passports were available, even if we, for travels within Soviet bloc, uh, could use just citizenship ID. Uh, but I had passport, and I, I was happy that I have it. But what was the problem was the exit, exit permit, actually. Uh, and this was a very strong tool of communist regime to to, to decline uh, and prevent people of traveling. Uh, and uh, your application to travel abroad um, uh, could be declined without explanation. You could ask uh, for clarification uh, within one year, you know, but usually, and I, I did it. I uh, perhaps 15 years every year applied uh, to go for one week to France to see the castles, and always it was declined, and uh, the response always arrived that I don't qualify. So this was the explanation. And uh, one last uh, point which I would like to mention is that. Uh, the regime also used, and I think perhaps in Poland was the same, to prevent the attempts to emigrate also by punishing even distant relatives of those who emigrated. And uh, this was even a main, main problem after uh, after collapse of communism when people from abroad returned home and met family members, and it was now like... You emigrated and your children studied at the university and your son is now a lawyer and your daughter is a medical doctor and I was fired from my job because of you and my children could not study because of you. So actually the really very intimate family relations were also very damaged even years after communism collapsed because of this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for this comedy. They show also the, the diversity of the communist regimes in the Soviet bloc. Absolutely. Because the questions about class origin, they were in the elite questionnaires, but they were in many other questionnaires, which every citizen had to feel like entering a school or a university or a social organizations or, you know, dozens of, and of course the party. In the early questionnaire, there was a special requirement to write by hand a biography, autobiography. And again, that was used you know, repeatedly to check for the consistency or inconsistency of the, of, of, the, of the narrative. Later on, after these big reforms of mid-1950s, with the post-Stalinist Polish, Polish communism, there was no question about the class origin in the past war question, and there was no question about the religion. Well, with the religion, in the country where you have 90% of Catholics. Um, so, it, it, there was no such question, but there were, um, especially in the early passports, there were detailed questions about what did you do during the war? Where, where did you spend the war? Were you a member of an underground organization? Were you arrested by the Germans? Where did you? So I think up to the, up to the uh, mid-1950s, the war period was a very important testing moment. Uh, um, and uh, belonging, participation in social organizations, that was a, an important question. Party, youth organizations, trade unions, someone not belonging to anything. Okay? That was a message for the security of there is something wrong about this person who doesn't belong to, 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 to nothing. And uh, uh, speaking about the people who were punished for a family member, yes, in passport matters, uh, uh, a relative of someone who refused to return from the West was denied passport for at least two years. Some people were, were blacklisted for a for, for longer period. Up to 1956, 
and it was much more serious things because there was immediate assumption that someone was now working for Western intelligence. Those defectors were, by definition, assumed to be now in the hands of CIA or, or another Western intelligence. So that was very risky for, for the family members. Later on, not, except for, as I said, restrictions on, on travel abroad to prevent further emigration and punish the defector. The, the, uh, it, was, it was not the case. And I think it would be interesting to compare uh, the, uh, the varieties of the passport policies. You know, it's interesting that all of them certainly tried to imitate the Soviet model initially, but they didn't know it. Now, and this is when I realized, you know, I, I would like to refer to, to, to our colleague Ivan Krastev's book on, on imitation as a humiliating process. Now that of, uh, the, the, the communist regimes in Central Europe were also projects in imitation. And sometime in a good faith that you know, people believe that Soviet Union is the best solution, so let's do it the same, but not, not always. And the problem was, should we imitate the result, the Soviet Union of 1950, or should we imitate the path? Have some kind of nap at the beginning, you know, then gradually. So imitation, in fact, is a creative process. You need to invent a lot. And uh, you know, when you have 40% of Soviet officers in the border guards, relatively easy, you go to the Soviet officer and you ask him, how is it, how do you do it? And you just make it copy. But late after 56, when there were few Soviets in Poland, actually just a handful of officers remained who had Polish wives, uh, then it was very much a matter of, 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 of creativity, innovation, <coughs> because Soviets were secretive. They were not ready to share the, the secrets, and that was for me a surprise. On the one hand, they wanted everyone to imitate the Soviet Union, and on the other hand, they didn't want to share how, how they do it. But I think a comparative study of Czechoslovakia, maybe you now Romania and Poland, would be a, a fascinating story. Darius, go ahead quickly, please. Um, it will be very quick, I promise. Um, in fact, a question uh, pops up in my mind related to migration studies mostly, uh, because when we are looking at the syllabuses and um, uh, theories in migration studies, it's very Western-oriented and very Eurocentric as well. And when there are all these efforts in terms of decolonizing, um, it, it, I, it is fascinating to see that how Eastern Bloc during the Cold War era was totally neglected when we are talking about the securitization of the 90s. It was totally about the Western world and it was not really shift of the policy, but it was shift of the blocks maybe. So it was more like um, the securitization policy in the Eastern Bloc was shifted after the end of the world, uh, after the end of the Cold War world, uh, world and um, just to uh, the, the other part of the world and to say that, okay, now uh, the curtains are lifted and these people are now released. And again, the same people were seen as threat, but from the other side and to try to block them in their own places. And the strategies were reversed this time to, uh, to block the same people and then it spread all around. So again, for these readings in the migration studies, it showed me how the policy was totally, uh, securitization during this time was totally neglected and uh, is not really talked about. Mm -hmm. I know the, 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 best, the best evidence for the domination of Western perspective in migration studies is when you read about migration policy. It means immigration policy. It's almost never out migration policy. It's clearly from the receiving end of, of, of the migration process that, process that, it's, that it's written. And second, I think that uh, a colleague of mine in migration studies speaks about the global east. You have the global south, global north, and the communist bloc doesn't fit in this story for a reason like, like, like this one, like, like the migration story. And it has its after effects up to the present. It, it is as... It doesn't belong to, to the south, it doesn't belong to the north, well, some countries do belong, or increasingly belong, but I think uh, it's, it's an important omission and, and migration studies show it very well. Arius, thank you very much for this very rich presentation, great discussion.
uh, comments by Rana Beer, which in the end posed this question, if I dare say, of Fortress Europe. Are we now the Poland expanded to the 27 member states that are trying to keep out people? So lots more to discuss. Please join me in thanking Dariusz and Rana Beer.